Welcome back, everybody, to part two of the May edition of the Four Real Movie Club. We're talking dinosaur movies. We just talked about The Land Before Time, and now we're moving on to what I would assume everybody, if you have seen one of these films, you've seen this one. The biggest name of all the films on the list here, and the main reason why we're doing this edition to Jurassic Park, the 1993 sci-fi film that really just changed cinema. Amazing, amazing movie that, um, in more ways than one, too, changed the game. Uh, mostly, I would say, for the uh, CGI aspect. And uh, when I went back and I rewatched this movie, which I've seen this movie a dozen, you know, certain times. Love it. One of my favorite movies when I can just go back, put it on, whatever. But uh, I made sure this time around to watch some of the more obscure DVD stuff and um, special features and the documentaries that they've done on it and stuff. Uh, very interesting when it comes down to the CGI. They didn't plan on having pretty much any CGI because, you know, at the time it wasn't really the most well-known thing. It wasn't a fully developed system and stuff. But they went out of their way to get the typical people for the stop-motion animation. And once it figured out that CGI was the way to go, uh, the, the stop-motion stuff became just more of a tracking record and kind of a pre-vis situation. Uh, it's kind of nuts to think about that, that this movie essentially killed the stop motion animation field. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I don't know that much about the technical side of it, but I noticed you called it a science fiction film. Mm -hmm. How you you really consider it? I know some people call it a, an adventure film. Some people call it a thriller too, and it's kind of like a couple different aspects of each. Because uh, I'm. I'm a big fan of Michael Crichton, you know, the novels of Michael Crichton. Right. And of course, I saw the movie way before I read the, the book, but he's kind of known as like the techno thriller. There's some kind of technology, Go you know, wrong. technology. Yeah, you know, and then something bad happens. That's kind of how a lot of his books go. Yeah, I consider it a, 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 an adventure film. Sure, you can, you know, say there's science fiction, but I, I don't know. I mean, it, I think that's what's one of the appeal, the big appeals of it is that it does, it has a good cross genre, you know, thing going on there. Yeah, it's not too sci fi where like it becomes like dorky. Like, a lot of yeah. people, it's hard to, for them to get into a film like that because if you're explaining stuff, especially something like a Star Wars or whatever, you're like, all right, come on. Like, they yeah, got yeah, these, yeah. you know, the ships are flying and whatever like that. Now, I love Star Wars, but. Um, <laughs> Spaceships and laser guns, that's science fiction. Right. Well, Star Wars 2 is, is cross-genres. I mean, there yeah. is some... There's fantasy elements, there's action-adventure, you know. Elements as well. You've got the master and the student and, you know. So it's good to see that, like, the sci-fi aspect that they have in this, it's muted enough that people can just go into it. And they also do a good job, I think, of trying to explain it in, like, a simple way. I always was a big fan of the fact that, like... They got a lot of the exposition out of the way with that little introductory film. That's that one did. of my favorite scenes, man. I love that with the little uh, cartoon yeah, creature. Yeah, the little DNA guy. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's awesome. It's such a good way of doing it because it's like it works in the story without people just explaining stuff. You know, one of the oddest things about films is when a character exists to be Mr. Exposition and he's just like – well, this is what's happening right now, and I'm explaining it to the people that already know. Well, these people would know, but to a general tourist at Jurassic Park, they wouldn't. There's a great scene, in speaking of good exposition you know, happening, uh, the Terminator, when they're being chased, and yeah. Kyle is explaining things to Sarah Connell. Well, guess what? There's a badass car chase going on with this motherfucking Terminator on their ass, and, you know, it, it, what a great way to explain what's happening because there's also a mystery at this point. If you The first time you've ever seen The Terminator, you don't know what's happening. So you want somebody to kind of explain it. And the same thing with Jurassic Park. You know, that scene happens right after you see the big, huge dinosaurs in the field for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're wondering, you're, like, how the hell did they do this? Like, Oh, yeah, I mean, so you're in the place of the characters so strongly that you don't mind exposition. You don't even, you know, you're you're dying for it, and that's what makes it work so well, you know. And it's also presented like a little kid's thing, so it's like it's dumbed down, and like, so you're never gonna run into anybody who's watching the movie and they're going like, I still don't fucking get it. Like, you know, if you don't get it at that point, you're not going to. 
you know. It's not some PhD, you know, scientist yeah. saying, well, this is uh, dioxyribonucleic acid, and this is the form of the blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You know, it would bore you to tears, but it's fun. And it also fits, like you said, within the story. They're going to have some kind of ride like this at the park. And John Hammond is showing off and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. We spared no expense. People are going to go through this. I'm showing it to you first. You know, there's other layers going on there. It all makes, you know, it all matters. It's such a good way to do it. And it, they do that throughout the whole film. I mean, there's a lot of different setup for different things. I mean, of course, John Hammond saying we spared no expense, that it's like, yet they were completely neglectful of, um, what was his name? Uh, Wayne Knight's character. You know, the reason why he screws everything up for them is because they did spare expense. <laughs> yeah. And there's yeah. the beginning scene, the helicopter. Um, I didn't know this until years after I had seen the movie. I didn't, you know, think too much about a lot of like the background stuff when it comes to films. But later on, there's a message from Jeff Goldblum and he says, life finds a way. Uh, yeah. When they're talking about the every dinosaur in the park is female so you can't reproduce well in the helicopter grant has the two female ends of the uh buckle for his seatbelt, and they're looking around and they're all you know strapping themselves in and all he does is he just ties a knot yeah he's bad with technology and everything like that and and he yeah. finds a way to get the two female ends to work like that's yeah. it's brilliant uh, that they do that kind of stuff it's so great and it's really cool man i never noticed that of course, wow. the uh, the theme song, you know, that's one of the biggest parts about this movie. That's, and you're going to talk about something brilliant. There's something right there. On Williams, baby, come on. That's Williams is he, a man. He really is. Him and Spielberg together. I mean, come on. Like you can't, it, you know, it, you can't get better than that. Spielberg is actually my favorite director of all time. So, you know, Jurassic Park is probably I don't know maybe fourth or fifth favorite Spielberg film. And I remember. One? Number one, Raiders of Lost Ark. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Raiders of Lost Ark. Schindler's List is up there, Temple of Doom. You know, I love Indiana Jones, so. Um, but Jurassic Park, I remember watching that in the theater, and I walked out thinking I would see dinosaurs walking down the street. <laughs> yeah. That's how, now I'm older than you, okay? I was in high school, um, or just had graduated high school. That's a magical thing, man. I mean, to walk out of a theater just blown away, you know, and it and it holds up all these years later. It does, and there's so many movies that came out even after this, and you look at it and you're like, that is so fake. <laughs> oh, the like, seats, it still looks amazing. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell, really, I mean, there are certain scenes if, you know, you're somebody who studies films and stuff like that, you're like, well, this had to have been CGI. But you look at, like, the Triceratops, it's sick. And you're like, well, you know, that could be that could be CGI in that shot. That could be uh, just a mechanical one in that shot. I'm pretty sure that one's mostly mechanical, but yeah, it's um, got to because they're touching it. I mean, they're on top yeah. of it and it's up and down, you know, when it's breathing. But it's crazy. I mean, that holds up. The theme song, of course, one of the most recognizable theme songs in movie history. Yeah. Uh. The first time you, you said, you know, you leave the movie theater and you're thinking you're going to see dinosaurs walking down the street. The first time you see a dinosaur in this movie, they make you wait. You know, they build it up. And that's just magical. Yeah. Like, yeah. a lot of movies, they pat themselves on the back and it's like, well, when you do this, you're going to, you know, shit yourself. And you're just like, eh. You know, okay. Spielberg, knows, Spielberg knows probably better than any director ever how to build up and, and pay off. Look at Jaws. Yeah. At what point in the movie do we see Jaws? You know, almost right at the very end. And it's such, it, I mean, it's now, an, it's an iconic moment in, in cinema history, but it's like, damn, the impact on the audience, on the viewer is so amazing that you just, you never forget it. And the same thing with the T-Rex in this movie. I mean, easily one of the best shots of the entire film is that T-Rex with the banner falling. Yep. Oh, right at the end. I love yeah. that. They originally weren't going to do that. They said the first ending was going to be the two different raptors were going to get killed by Grant. He was going to operate some kind of like a crane and like crush them. Ah, uh, which I'll that would have been so disappointing. But well, let me ask you this then, because I've heard complaints about the Indian with the T Rex being a you know, um, Deus ex uh, machina. Mm -hmm. 
do you, I mean, do you understand that complaint? Yeah, think- I mean, it, it makes sense because he does just kind of pop up out of nowhere and save the yeah. day. But the, yeah, could, the wait, justification it's- that um, Spielberg had for it before was, oh, well, T-Rex is the star of the film, and if we don't do it, people are going to be mad, and eh, they'll just buy it. And it's like, yeah, people do. Like, you know. They do. It works. It, it totally works. And it doesn't really come out of nowhere. I mean, you know that thing was tracking them right. this whole time, so it's like it had to be around somewhere. You know Plus, what I mean? They say in the movie he doesn't want to be fed; he wants to hunt. Yeah. So you know he eats the goat, you know, because that's a goat, free goat. Like, <laughs> but uh, what better to hunt than the ones that are the better hunters out of the whole bunch of them? You know, you can get some some nice raptor meat. <laughs> you know the the T Rex is an animal. They they don't treat it like a monster film. They treat it like it's a bunch of animals. So. It's an escape. It's, gonna... it's like, uh, or Cujo or something, some mad beast that's mm-hmm. just it's to eat, you know? Yeah, he's not there to have like a vendetta. He's there to eat people. He's there to eat animals. It's... And, you know, the raptors are loud. They're something that it's familiar with. So, hey, if I could go for a raptor instead of a human, I'll go for the raptor. And the humans can just escape. It's. They conveniently have found a way, and they, of course, they didn't plan a lot of this stuff ahead of time, but, uh, like, they put themselves in a position where most of the plot holes can be explained still. Yeah. Even when it comes down to, like, now that we know that um, raptors should have feathers on them. Well, they already said in the movie that they use frog DNA to complete that. So, you know, there's no feathers on frogs, are there? There you go. There's your explanation. Not really dinosaurs, though. What's interesting, you know, my wife and I watched all three Jurassic Park films, you know, over the last week or so, really? and we just watched three today, which, I, in my opinion, is highly underrated. I like three a lot. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty solid film. But, um, you know, Sam Neill's character, Dr. Grant, says dinosaurs are extinct. They died 65 million years ago. The creatures that John Hammond and all of them made on the island are not dinosaurs. Yeah. They're just monsters. They're dinosaur-esque. They have a lot of the same, you know, features and stuff, but they're not real dinosaurs. Frankenstein. Yeah. They are Frankenstein creatures that were created in a lab, and guess what? You know, Mother Nature is going to find her, you know, not just that life finds a way, but don't mess with Mother Nature. I think that's really the message, you know, because we, we can't control it. And I think that's that's a really intriguing aspect of the film, you know, that di- that dinner scene where, you know, they're all trying to, you know, explain or figure out what, you know, why are they doing this? And, you know, the lawyer guy is the only one that's sticking up for him. And yeah, I love that line. The uh, what is it? The only one I've got on my side is the blood sucking lawyer. <laughs> yeah. And it's true because he's seeing dollar signs and that's all John Hammond sees. Even in the second one. He still wants to go back and do it. Yeah. It's how are you ever going to learn? Like, how can you be that stupid? There's another great line that explains really just everything. Uh, Jeff Goldblum says, "You've been so preoccupied with whether or not you could that you didn't stop to think if you should." It's a brilliant, brilliant way to put it. He's great in the movie too. Uh, you know, he's got the. Like the gratuitous pose shot with the smooth, uh, smooth operator shirt open and stuff, you know, typical, yeah. like, uh, you know, the sex appeal kind of thing. But his character is just great, you know, he's yeah. an ass, a complete ass. And yeah, he's, he's smart, not. you know, he's not just a jerk, he's smart on top of it. Yeah, he understands. Well, what's funny is, like, the book, um, for anybody that's read the novel of Jurassic Park, he's a much bigger character, really. I mean, oh, yeah. He's a much bigger character. But I, I would have to say this is one of the rare instances where I like the movie better than the book. I've never and read the book. but Good. Good. It's a little too technical at times. Um, but it's good. It's really good. Now, the book, uh, if uh, Ian Malcolm, if he's a bigger character in that, is he – essentially the same kind of character though or they just with a bigger part or does he have like you know sometimes they'll they actually they switched around the uh the children for the movie yeah so do they do that kind of thing with him like is he more of like the lawyer or something like that like no 
He's a chaos etician, whatever he calls himself. And he's more into – there's something very interesting in the book. Okay, He says that mankind – like he goes deeper into the arrogance of mankind. You know, that we think we have a perspective on the universe and we don't. You know, a thousand years to the earth is nothing. Right. A million years to the earth is nothing. And the average human, la you know, lives about 75 years. Like, how can we possibly think that we have a handle on existence? We don't know anything. You know what I mean? We're completely clueless. The um, <laughs> the character of Ian Malcolm is great, um, but most of the characters are. I mean, uh, one of my favorites is easily Wayne Knight's character, and uh, he is just as like as lovable of a villain as you can get. Like you don't really hate Dennis Nedry, but he's clearly the villain of the film. Dotson, yeah. Dotson, Dotson here. Yeah, see, Isn't nobody it? cares. <laughs> That's such a great line. Don't get cheap on me now, Dotson. <laughs> I love him. It's a shame that he couldn't have returned. I mean, obviously he had to die, but you know. Well, again, he represents, uh, you know, the fact that if you try something like this, you, you're going to have people gunning for you. It's just inevitable. I mean, you know, John Hammond, as brilliant as a, a guy that he is, He's just in over his head. He doesn't understand it. You know, it's arrogance. You know, pride cometh before the fall. I mean, there you go. Yeah, and even when it comes to the hunter, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Muldoon. He is, you know, he's more concerned with the idea of, hey, he gives respect to the raptors, but he, he kind of goes off on his own a little bit. And it's like, well, I'm going to go get them because I'm a better hunter. Yeah. Well, I think for him, you know, I feel bad for that guy because – at least his heart was in the right place. I mean, I think maybe yeah. he was the only one. He was the most capable of going out and doing what he was doing. You know, it's just he was in over his head like everybody else. Right. You know, he. I mean, who else are you going to send? Yeah, you're not going to send John Hammond. <laughs> yeah, they could have done it. It's just, you, you know, the Raptors. It's kind of weird, though. Out of all the people that are in this movie, the only person I think that's coming back for Jurassic World is B.D. Wong. Yep, he's the only one. That's like, when they first showed the previews for uh, Jurassic World, I was like, oh, is uh, Chris Pratt playing Tim? You know, that kind of a thing. Like, But I guess they've all gotten their, their use out of stuff. You know, Goldblum's in the second one, Sam Neill and Laura Dern are in the third. Uh, Richard Attenborough, of course, he can't because he's unfortunately passed away. But he had a cameo in the second one. Yeah, he was able to do that. That was good. Yeah. It's, it's had a nice continuity. What, I, what I'm glad about with Jurassic World is that it is a sequel. Yeah, instead of a reboot. Instead of a reboot. So what's cool is like the promise of a park, like an actual theme park where you go and see dinosaurs is happening with Jurassic World. Yeah. That's pretty damn cool. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, I, you know, I'm starting to geek out a little bit because – here it is, and, and the early buzz is, is very positive from what I've heard. I'm hoping it's great because if it's anything like Jurassic Park, I mean, you got it. But a um, couple notes that I had written down here, uh, we talked about the, the idea of a lot of these things holding up, you know, the CGI, the music, the even the explanations of, like, the dinosaurs and the technology and stuff. One thing definitely doesn't, and it's the whole uh, – the the little girl um Alex, she's just like oh it's an interactive CD ROM and I'm a hacker and all this and it's like oh god, I know. it's so embarrassing now. At the time it made sense, but you know, I don't even remember computers at all in 1993. No. I mean, so it must have been pretty fascinating. It was crazy uh, at that time because it's like even in '96 you were using like Encarta and Encyclopedia and stuff and. Uh, the only part that holds up when it comes to her character like that is the fact that she wants to be a vegetarian because that's like more popular than ever. <laughs> but uh... well, I love I love you know Dr. Grant and Sam Neill's character. I love his arc. You know, like he doesn't like kids at first, and he scares the crap out of that kid at the beginning on the <laughs> on the. Just remember, you're alive when they begin to eat you. 
And then at the end, he's got this connection with these kids, and it's great. You know, it's kind of smalty, but it it just works. You know, it's fun. It's very Spielbergian. It's very Spielbergian. Yes, yeah. he's always got that the dad thing going on. Yeah, I don't think I've seen a single film of his that doesn't have something like that. <laughs> You know, it's uh, even like Super 8 and stuff, like it's you know, struggling dad or a guy who doesn't want to have kids or something like that. Every movie. But uh, it works, you know. It's just a shame that in the third movie that they don't have Ellie and uh, Alan together. That always bugged me. Yeah. Well, she wanted to have kids and he didn't and they, you know, kind of went their separate ways, I guess. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a little depth to the in-between the films. I like imagining what took place in between these films and it's like hey she got a family she got what she wanted he's doing his science thing and you know giving these speeches and uh, that's kind of cool you know it's more realistic yeah i mean as realistic as you can get when all this kind of crazy yeah. shit happens <laughs> <laughs> one note i got here for alan grant uh, harrison ford turned down the role wow really yeah, he you know just didn't think that it was right for him, and I think he's right. In the end, I think this is Sam Neill's. If not, it would have just been Harrison Ford running around with dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, he's too big. I think casting wise, though, they they hit the nail on the head. I can't think of anybody that would have been better. No, no, it's a fantastic cast for sure. Uh, Everybody, another, little yeah. memorable thing, you know. Another note I got here, um, probably my favorite shot of the movie outside of the banner falling scene. How great is it when they're trapped in the car and the water in the glass starts rippling? That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's it's been it's been parodied and, and, you know, mimicked so many times now that it's yeah, it's. It's, it's pretty genuinely up. terrifying. It you, is. You know shit's about to go down dude you got twelve thousand pounds of of born killer coming towards you you know what i mean that could bite you in half without even thinking and it's just that impending doom it, you know they don't have to show you know the t-rex's uh face getting ready to eat them or something it's just you know it's the jaws effect you know what's coming but you, you know don't know how bad it's gonna be you can't do anything about it. The cars aren't running. It's dark. The fences are out. You're fucked. I mean, that's it. You know. So, what would you say? Some other favorite, least favorite things from this movie? You know, I have to go back to the the first reveal. Like that was just crazy. You know, I I, I will always remember that. Um, another one is the scene when. Um, Lord Dern's character goes back and tries to turn the power on. She's looking for Samuel Jackson, and the the raptor shoves its face through the through the little fence there, through the little door. I jumped out of my seat. I almost pissed myself in the theater. Yeah. And, and when she I goes went, backward, and it's just yeah. his arms. Yeah. Well, right after that, she finds his arm, and then the raptor jabs its head through the yeah opening. I went back to see it again in the theater, you know, and the guy next to me almost jumped out of his seat. And I started, <laughs> and, you know, he gave me a dirty look and I was like, dude, don't worry. I, the same thing happened to me. Right. Because I knew what was coming that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you, now you're like, okay, well, this is the shot where the guy in the toilet's fucked. And this is the shot where, you know, this is happening, whatever. But first time around, you're not expecting it. Yeah. You're not expecting it. I like when the car is coming down the tree. And they, they're, you know, Sam Neill and the kid are trying to get down to the ground, and they get down to the ground, and then the car falls on them again. Yeah. And like, we're back in the car again. Yeah. He's like, I threw up. <laughs> 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 Typical little kid thing. You're getting chased by a goddamn dinosaur. You've watched somebody get mauled to death. I threw up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's great. I like the three of them together. You know, Sam Neill and the two kids. Like, they go through some shit together. You know what I mean? They're being chased. They have to go over the fence. And, like, you know, the kid gets electrocuted. And he's got to give him CPR. And, like, I mean, that's some real bonding there. That's, like, great storytelling. You know, they, they have a reason, um, you know, to have a, a bond together. Because they actually go through things. 
And there's a great interaction with Sam Neill's character in them because you can see him warming up to them. Like, yeah. you know, you said the first scene that he's dealing with that one kid with the uh, the archaeological dig, and he's always like, well, they're going to fuck you up. They're going to slit your friggin' uh, stomach and whatever. And then you get, like, the I threw up thing, and his response isn't like, oh, shut up, you know, just get out of the car. It's, I'm not going to tell anybody that you threw up, Tim. And well, when he gets to the fence, he pretends that he's getting electrocuted to fuck around with the kids a little bit, like... It's a great, it's a great evolution, and you see, you know, at the beginning, like you said, with the kid on the on the dig, he just doesn't get it. He doesn't get that kids are kids, and then when he comes back to the car, um, you know, with Jeff Goldblum, and Jeff Goldblum's like, "Are the kids okay?" Sam Neill's like, uh, "I don't know. I didn't ask." Right. It's like he just he doesn't get it. You know what I mean? So it's great to yeah to see him evolve and to actually understand. You know, kids are going to be kids, you know. They're going to get scared, and they need people to, to help them, adults to help them. So 0 out of 10, what do you give Jurassic Park? Oh, man. It's it's at least a 9.5. I mean, 10 is pretty rare for me, but it, it's as close to perfect as a movie can get. Definitely agree. I'm giving that a nine. Same reasons though. It's uh, the only reason I wouldn't give it a ten is because ten is something that you got to reserve for like absolutely one hundred percent perfect, and that's almost impossible. Yeah. But amazing movie, and one of those films that if anybody hasn't ever seen it, drop what, what? you're doing and go see Jurassic Park. What is wrong with you? Right. But there are other movies that uh, we have coming our way, and the next one we're going to talk about is the sequel to this one, which, uh, you know, it's not exactly the same, but it's got its good points. That's The Lost World, Jurassic Park, coming up in part three. As I mentioned before, iTunes and Stitcher listeners, all you got to do is wait a second and we will be right back. And if you're on YouTube, then you need to click on part three, and uh, that'll be it. So part three coming your way, Lost World, Jurassic Park, for the May edition of the For Real Movie Club.